How many of us are familiar with Grey Gardens? Oh, good, I love it. Okay, so this was kind of weird, but for some reason, I've been thinking a lot about Little Edie Bouvier, Beale Bouvier. Um, and the Maisel's documentary about Grey Gardens talks about this mother-daughter who live in a sort of derelict mansion in the East Hamptons. And in a lot of ways, it's a very sad story. But one of the reasons that I love it is because Little Edie especially is probably one of the mo most poignant thinkers you will find in a documentary. And one of the quotes that I think comes up quite a bit um, as you search the internet and search for clips and other things is this one. Um, she's reminiscing and she says, it's very difficult to keep the line between the past and the present. You know what I mean? It's awfully difficult. And I know that this frames this in terms of the past, but I think sometimes when we think about things, we think about, well, the past is this discrete thing, the present is this other discrete thing, and then the future is this other discrete thing. And especially when talking with libraries, I think many of us, because the work we're doing is so important, is focused on the present, because we're responding to really urgent and important needs. And sometimes then when people come in and they wanna talk about the future, it can be somewhat off-putting perhaps, um, it can sometimes come across as perhaps disrespectful to the very important work that's happening in the present. But I think what Little Edie is trying to say is that it's all part of a continuum. And so a part of me has been wondering, what would Little Edie start to think about in terms of the line between the present and the future? And how hard is it for us to determine what that line is? And in truth, I think it's very hard to keep a very distinct line between the present and the future because it's always emergent. It's always kind of stringing together this idea of what we're doing right now. We do not simply because we're being responsive to what's happening in our communities now, but we do it because we have a vision for the types of organizations and the types of people and the types of communities that we want to be going forward. I would say also, um, you know, I, I feel with so many things these days, lines are blurred uh, with our intersectionality as people and places and experiences, you know, uh, that those lines, we're all stepping over them. There's uh, this poet whom I stalked for a little while, Achi Obeha, um, and she would always talk about, she's Cuban American, she has a great book, We Came All the Way from Cuba for You to Dress Like This, uh, <laughs> short stories that are hilarious. And, but she always, and this was in the 90s, so you know, this is tight. She would always talk about dancing on both sides of the hyphen. And I think we do that with, you know, some of us, uh, given wherever we are, er, you know, actually in a lot of different stratas, we're always, whether we like it or not, and sometimes I don't like it, uh, are kind of bopping around these hyphens. Absolutely. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about ways of thinking about the future, because I think sometimes we miss the philosophical point of what uh, Little Edie is saying. We think that the future is going to be defined by people sequestering themselves off and thinking about things deeply or I in different tangential ways and then coming back and telling us. But I think it's really important for us to think constructively about how all of us can think about the future. So Veranda and I wanted to walk through four different people's perspectives of thinking about the future. Um, Can I, before you do that yeah. fancy thing, um, one thing, I just want to set up, <laughs> you're like, I'm gonna jack you when we get off this <laughs> stage. <laughs> the, there are uh, several challenges with this talk that you guys are, has anyone watched Jerry Springer in these? <laughs> ben. Uh, <laughs> He's like so embarrassed. So we we are just have very different styles in case that's not clear yet. But um, you know, obviously Miguel is the director for the Center of the Future at ALA, and I am a library chick. So, and I say that to say, uh, though I'm so interested in this and I've learned so much from him about it, my goal today is like, what does all of this mean? And to and I've learned a lot even working with him on it, but. You know, we want this to be conversational. Uh, you know, like Jerry. <laughs> Maybe not so much like Jerry. Um, so, but we want, this is all of us. Uh, we're on this journey together, okay? So I just wanted to say, you're like, why are you saying You know this is my struggle. Like, I know, I know. Like, I'm a total uptight control freak. I know, freak. I love this. 
I can deal with it in private, but you've got me on stage <laughs> oh, doing this. Oh, yeah, you this, can deal with it in private, too. It's no good. It's not good. Okay. <laughs> so the first person is somebody that I always bring out. And if you've seen me present before, this is usually like the third or fourth slide. It always is because Jane McGonigal is a genius, number one. <laughs> um, and she's just brilliant. So if you know who Why Jane is she a genius? Okay, do you want me to shut up right no, now? No, no, no. Why no. is she a genius? So why is she a genius? Jane McGonigal is a scholar whose research is excellent. She's a consulting futurist. She's a game designer and game oh, developer. Yeah, I did look her up. Yeah. She has wonderful opinions about so many different things and she's just smart as smart can be. Yeah. So didn't she do that talk how gaming change can yeah, I yeah. looked at her TED talk yeah. and she was so that actually is interesting, you guys. <laughs> it is really how gaming saves the future. And she was talking about yeah, she's great. So um, you can look up the TED talk, th oh, I'm sorry, the South by Southwest EDU talk that she did, but she said how to think and learn like a futurist. And distilling it down just to its four essential points, she says that we need, she, she believes strongly that anyone can do this, it's important to say, mm -hmm. that anyone can engage in these four steps, collect signals from the future. She says that those are things that we observe in the present, whether it's at our library work, the people that we see, the things that they're asking for, the nature of the work that they're doing in our spaces. But it's also the things that we see outside of our identity as library professionals and library workers, things that we see with our families, things that we watch on television, anything else. She says that we start to combine those signals into forecasts. We start to ask ourselves, okay, as we look at those signals and think about them, how do they help us think about not only what's changing in the present, but what might change in the future? She says that we have to create personal foresight. To a certain extent, we have to ask ourselves not just how those change the world, but how they change the types of people that we want to be and the types of organizations that we want to build. And then lastly, she challenges us to play with the future. Um, she believes that to a certain extent, the future is somewhat imaginary, and that should give us the freedom to start to think in bold and positive ways about what the future could be, to seek the aspirational, and to sort of be playful, tell fun stories, tell interesting things, and start to motivate people in those directions. So, uh, <laughs> chime in. <laughs> You're like, go Jerry, ahead. can't Jerry, stop. Yes. Jerry. <laughs> you know, Jerry is lower on my list, and now I have aspirations higher, um, like Real Housewives. Um, so in terms, I'm really intrigued by most with this, by the play with the future piece, because I think, I mean, I am at work, I, w I work for Khalifa, uh, the uh, Consortium of California Libraries. How many of you are Khalifa members before I go on? Thank you. I'm very new there, so I'm looking forward to chatting in with you afterward and sharing my information. Um, with that being said, the you know I've worked in quite a few libraries, and I'm sure you have too. And I've always done it for a paycheck, so that means I'm playing by someone else's rules. So, depending on the culture and what's go other priorities, sometimes it's challenging to have the opportunity within the context of an organization to play with that future. Um, when I've when people, when I love to work with new librarians because I learn so much for them, and when they're looking for opportunities to do things like play with the future, I always encourage them in interviews to ask, describe a big change to me that you've done in the library. And how that, you know, if it's, is it something like, hey, we tried something new, we wanted to, you know, do, it didn't go well, so we tried something else. And if, you know, if that sounds good to you, then maybe that's the place you want to be. But I interviewed somewhere once, and they're like, well, we have coffee time at 10. And, and I'm not joking this. You, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, they're like, we changed it to 10.15. <laughs> and I thought they and, were kidding. And they added iced coffee. <laughs> yes. Well, you were there, so I don't know. Um, I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, and I'm like, this might not be my jam. <laughs> and I mean, for me, for me, you might love it. But so but, play with the future is the hardest one. Yeah. Every time I go into a presentation, play with the future is the dividing line between the mm. people who can and the people who can't. Because the play with the future, a lot of people start to chime in about, well, but our budget, mm -hmm. but our building is set up this way, but it's our hard. this is this or something else. So. McGonagall isn't saying that we should throw out all of those considerations. 
what she's urging us to do is say, if we don't articulate the positive, hopeful future for our organizations, no one else is. So, and if we can't articulate that positive, hopeful vision, how do we assemble power in our communities to start to change that? We have to start to circulate an idea that says, this is the aspirational vision that we could have if we do pursue these things. Um, I often think of Ryan Gravel, who did the Beltline in uh, Atlanta. Um, Atlanta has, is encircled by these sort of uh, abandoned railroad tracks, essentially. And as a grad student, he started to articulate this vision for that city that would revitalize that whole encircling space into green space and public space. And he slowly but surely started to assemble power all the way to the point that the city council started to pick it up as well. And they started to see that vision as well. But he had to play with the future. He had to assemble all the little parts and start to tell a different story than the narrative currently had. And that's tough for people, but it's what we have to do in a lot of ways. And I guess it's true, I hadn't, uh, um, that piece of it to what I would call kind of gain that agency takes uh, a level of boldness and uh, commitment and vision that sometimes is scary when, you know, things like budgets are on the line, sometimes it's scary to think of that. One thing that we are going to do a little later though is maybe talk through uh, small and large strategies to begin to use that kind of stuff in organizations that we hope are helpful. So. so I often bring out Marsha Lynn Ray as one of my second examples for thinking about the future. She kind of um, supports a lot of what Jane McGonigal says. So she says that foresight is thinking ahead to how trends, issues, and developments that can be observed in the present are likely to lead to alternative, uh, lead and shape alternative futures. She said, so again, it's about looking around at the environment you're in right now, starting to hone in on things that are changing, and then ask yourselves, what will those build toward? As we do those, she says that there are three things we have to ask ourselves. What are the key forces that are changing? So a little bit different than McGonagall, I think Marsha Ray draws a line and starts to say, you can't act on everything. You gotta pick your battles at some point. So you have to say, what are the key things that we want? For our organizations, that may, may be vision, mission, and value statements. Many of us are committed to literacy. Others of us are committed to active civic dialogue. Others of us have prioritized the sense of public space. So part of it, that helps. Part of it is also our own personal ethics and values and saying, you know what, I'm a stalwart intellectual freedom privacy person. I'm taking all the names of the trends that are threatening those, and those are key to me for what I'm doing in my work in the organization. She says that we also have to ask ourselves what might be their possible outcomes. If these things come to fruition, what, how would the world change? And then in a different way from the learning and from the play that has to happen, she says what might be the learning and implications uh, and actions that have to happen in the present to start to align ourselves to that vision of the future. So she thinks not only do we have to tell a story, but we have to ask ourselves what am I gonna commit to change about myself to prepare myself for that future. There's a certain inadequacy there, I think that's really hard, and there's a certain vulnerability to say, we are not wholly prepared to confront the future with who we are right now. We have to recognize some amount of deficiency in both who we are and the organizations that we've set up, but to recognize the power that we have to overcome those deficiencies if we start to plan and prepare right now. That's, uh, you know, what I was thinking of when you said that in terms of a, the library world is, for me, and I don't know how anyone in here feels, so this might be a Jerry moment, of, uh, for me, it's old thought to think of libraries as neutral. That's not my opinion. And uh, this idea of putting a stake in the ground and like p the priorities of who this library is and what we are to the community connected to that, and that we are not uh, that, not neutral, we're just not, in my opinion, we are not neutral space, you know? And and really articulating who you are is safe space, et cetera. So that's what that reminds, does that remind you of that? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted some affirmation. <laughs> okay, so two more to look at. So this is uh, Richard Loom, uh, and he wrote this book called Four Steps to the Future. It's a small little book, it's interesting. So He's cool. He's cool. I th cute too. It's, so I throw this up because it's a little bit different. So he believes that there's sort of four steps. Part of you has to look to the past to understand how we got to where we are. 
this is the weird thing that a lot of other uh, futurists or foresight people don't talk about, is an acknowledgement of the past. Mm -hmm. So here's why I think this is interesting, because we all know deep in our hearts that we're past people. Like most of the library and information people who come in, we have some amount of allegiance towards past practice. Um, and so sometimes this can be the dividing line, is that we think like, oh, well, the people who are gonna talk about the future are all those innovative whippersnappers and the upstarts and everything else, and it excludes the tenured, seasoned professionals, however you wanna frame it, it excludes them. And I think what this approach says is, no, it's very inclusive of that thinking as well. At one point, they say, if you wanna look 10 years into the future, you need to start your journey by looking 20 years in the past. So if you were to think about what's the future of our collections, part of your due diligence would be to start to do a self-study and say, well, how has our collection changed over the past 20 years? Or if you looked at a new building that would be uh, fruitful for the next 10 years, you'd have to ask yourself, well, what have been the pattern, the building patterns for the past 20 years to start to understand that future? So is that that kind of doomed to repeat it kind of thing? To a certain extent, but it also helps you understand both the pace of change that has happened so that you understand, okay, in the past 20 years, all of these remarkable changes have happened. How does that help set a context for what will actually happen in the next 10? Um, it sort of gives you that little barometer to evaluate against. So, um, and then you embark on the present to start to look at the changes in the present, the futures to start to think about how those futures will start to come to pass, and then also to articulate an aspiration. So something like McGonagall, at some point we have to coalesce and assemble around a shared vision that says this is the future that we want, this is the aspiration that we have. And that, you know, the, I, I share, I've shared with you, that aspiration piece is uh, my favorite because it's a, about, uh, for me, it's about that striving to connect our communities. Um, a little bit later, we're going to share signals that we've identified and what they've meant to us. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I am so shallow, I should just say that. Um, so it, a recent Project Runway episode, um, <laughs> you're gonna leave, aren't you? I still got this PowerPoint, so I'll just do it myself. Um, this recent project, does anyone watch, Pro okay, you may not want to admit it, I watch Project Runway. Do you remember the episode with the guy Dapper Dan? He is a Harlem uh, designer, fashion designer, which I hadn't heard of him. And what he did, what he is known for, and is now in a creative partnership with Gucci, is kind of doing this mix up with uh, logos from major brands, but giving them the street vibe, right? So on this episode, I don't know if you remember, we can watch it together. What, what I was most struck by is, I mean, like I have, my life has been in libraries. I worked at The Gap and then I worked at libraries. I went, I became, I went to library school and was a page and did stuff like that. But um, as he was, they were asking him, so how did you decide to do, what made you get into this? And he said, I thought to myself, what makes my community happy? And I'm like, damn, can I, can I say damn? Well, um, yeah, that's how I want to be as a librarian and how I want to connect people, my aspiration in the future to support communities is what makes my, and he specifically was talking about Harlem, the black community, that he, the neighborhood he lived in. But, and I always am thinking with this great work Miguel does, it's like, how do I get it? You know, how am I gonna get into this? And for me, it's like connecting things that I are my passions, which is a lot of pop culture, with my passion for libraries. And that really resonated to me in thinking about how we can have those aspirations for our, in this piece, this context for the future. Don't move on stuff you don't care about. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, so yeah, no, you mean that? Are you making fun of no, me? No, I, I mean it. So, like, uh, yeah, anytime you see people starting to talk about all of these mm -hmm. trends and other changes, don't move on stuff that yeah. you don't love. Like, if there's stuff that does not have resonance with your community, that means it doesn't resonate with your community. Yeah. And it's okay not to do that. And it's not your jam. You do have to do the things that make your people happy, things yeah. that both will make them happy and happiness to embrace security and mm -hmm. long-term health and other types of things. Okay, so our last one, 
Um, Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy book, let me just tell you, if you want a book that will make you happy and hopeful for the future, read Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. It is just amazing. Um, but she says, and she quotes a scholar, she says that emergence is, I'm going to steal this. Making fun that I had paper, do you recall? You're like, I'm okay, you guys, I have to tell you this. So before we come up here, he's like, yeah, I don't use paper anymore. Cause, and then this whole time, he's been reading my slides upside down. Thank you. May I get a round of applause? Thank you. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So she says, emergence is the way that complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. Think back to, you know, McGonagall says it's the stuff that's happening around us. It's lots of different places. So she's quoting that as well. And then she says that her vision is changing our how more, more than seeing clearly our what. I see a how where we are all much more comfortable with change and with our personal power to change conditions. I want a future where we are curious, interested, visionary, and adaptive. Um, to me, the resonant thing, and what I think all of us need to reorient ourselves toward, is that middle the middle section. My vision is changing our how more than seeing clearly our what. I think a lot of us invest in future strategies with a goal of prediction, and it's not prediction. Our goal should be a change in culture. It should be an opportunity for us to reorient the work that we do so that we're not just coming up with one solution, but we're creating a culture that helps foresee lots of different possible solutions and an adaptive culture that continues to think about the future, not once every five years, but in every day and in every way that we work. But you were, when we were talking about this, I think last night, you, like, the way you simplified it for me resonated more with me. I hope this is Mine is better than okay. yours, is what I'm saying right now. But wait, you guys, seriously, if you vote, on, put this on your evaluation about me, okay? Um, uh, simple interactions and getting to know each other. Yeah. And, and then how do we build harmony in getting there? I think that for uh, our us working together, but and for our communities, is what it's about. Simple interactions and getting to know each other is at the base of this and that the harmony that can build. So. I mean, I, one of the weird things that I often say, I think futures work is diversity work. It's really thinking how about so? how- Say that, some more about that. Because it's not about isolating certain ideas and privileging certain ways of thinking or privileging certain uh, final solutions that we come up with. It's fundamentally about figuring out the ways that we better relate to each other and bring together lots of different perspectives and ideas for a greater whole. And that's always what we're pursuing in diversity is the fact that you see things differently than I do and our vision is better for your working with me rather than something else. Yes, do it. Let's get a mic. Diversity is accessibility. Yes, accessibility. Thank you. So you're in the Bay Area. And this is the battle royale here where innovation, future is really, it's, a, it's the programmer white world that's pushing out a lot of people in social justice work. And Alameda County, we're kind of toying with the innovation and EDI and where is the spectrum connection to mm. it. And I see you two talking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, we can do this. And then I see all of the other EDI work or the work that we've done with Odlos and ALA with the um, Office of Diversity. And I'm not seeing that connect quite yet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing it theoretically, I'm, I'm hearing it verbally, I'm not visually seeing that connect. So can you talk a little bit about that? And this is that action piece, I think. Thank you. Oh, do you, is that, are you gonna say something else? Go ahead. No, I, I, I guess, um, that, the, thank you, Deb. But it is, uh, oh, wait. Uh, as her question was, just because I can't run back, um, she asked what EDI stands for, equity, diver diversity, and inclusion is what EDI stands for. So thank you for that request for clarification. No, don't be sorry. And this is, I mean, this is safe space. So um, please do ask any and everything. So do what, I was just saying that action piece. So I think one of the challenges that we have is that we've separated these conversations out. We think that we're doing diversity work 
um, exclusively for the sake of diversity work. And I think that that's an important issue for us to address is that diversity is about exploring concepts of justice and making sure that we both right the wrongs that have been done and build a more just future. But I think the other thing that sometimes we forget in the diversity conversation is the level of scholarship and research that has been done to show that diverse and inclusive teams consistently make better ideas, have better innovations, they come up with newer and better ideas than largely homogenous groups and also better than expert, perceived expert groups. And so if you look at uh, books like The Wisdom of Crowds by James Suryeki, um, a lot of the other research, uh, it, it consistently points to the idea that if you build organizations that allow lots of different people to talk, that honors and respects the different perspectives that people bring, um, that you will end up with a fundamentally better final product. Whatever goal you are pursuing, you will end up with a better product than if you do that as a homogenous group. Now, one of the challenges that we have, I think, is that in many of our organizations, we have cultures that are primed to have a largely homogenous group already. And so not only do we have to think about, well, how do we collectively uh, utilize the diversity that we have in our organization, but how do we also undo the systems to make sure that we have a fuller pipeline coming into our organization so that when people do arrive here, they feel welcome, they are ready to participate, and we are ready to, to leverage their great ideas for our collective benefit. I would also say, um, I recently at DPLA, D Digital Public Library of America Fest, which was just in Chicago, Elaine Westerbrook from uh, University of North Carolina, she's the university librarian there, spoke about, and she was speaking of the academic library world, but I believe this is across uh, types about uh, the role libraries can play in reconciliation. Uh, for, and I'm not just talking uh, about ethnic, I, I'm talking about barriers we've put up, at, we as an industry have put up in a lot of ways, and we as a country have put up to keep people out. And how, what reconciliation needs to occur and how we can play a role, an active role in that to move forward. Because um, sometimes, I mean, it, our industry is not unique in this that, uh, and I'm not speaking of any specific thing right now. Well, I am, but I'm being professional. Um, <laughs> it can be like lipstick on a pig. And that, okay, that pig's looking good, but you know, it, 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 where are we in our hearts? And where, you know, and it's back, to, to me, it's back to this, you know, commit, you know, us saying, g knowing people, what does that mean in your life? What does that mean in your community? What does that mean in our culture? What does that mean globally? And w where you are with that and where your organization is. And I don't think we have enough of a collective uh, to have done that to, to take on the work that you're really, to really commit authentically to that kind of work. We don't believe it, as you said, what those, that kind of scholarship hasn't trickled down. Well, we don't think about it together. I think we, we still think about them as two separate mm -hmm. ideas, but we really need to unify our thinking. Yeah, in that. yeah. Can we do the uh, microphone? Hang on one second. I'm doing the lunges today. I know, I, you see I'm not even getting up. <laughs> Uh, so I think a lot of what's happening with the theory and trickling down is that it's at, this, at the first step and people are not thinking about how diversity work and thinking about a collective of diversity affects outcome measures. Ooh, yeah. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. And without doing the thoughtful work on how outcome measures are the traditional old school way of measuring things that don't apply to a lot of diversity work, mm -hmm. then, then we can't argue for the, say, well, we're doing all this meaningful work, but the outcome measures are not there. It to doesn't fit in reflect. that structure, exactly. that historic. So Miguel, that's like, thank you. I feel like you should be up here with us. <laughs> I'm like, I should be up here, she should. Um, but that kind of uh, also, in my opinion, uh, uh, new ways of working, uh, and they're not new, 
but in this in this in these white institutions let me just say you know that's new so but it speaks to uh remember we were talking about how you were saying um futures work tends to have the elements of feminism in it why don't you i want you to say that right now <laughs> is it on the screen so i don't know that it has a, so well, you did say that don't lie so I guess I, what I'll say is that I choose to mostly quote women when I talk about futures thinking. That's just the way that I choose to do things. And I think the only male that I put up is Richard. someone of ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of that is because I think that those individuals frame thinking about the future from a collective, yeah, inclusive a, yeah. vision. They think that we're not waiting for a savior. We're not here to find an expert. We're here to prove the inherent value that everyone provides towards a vision of the future. And that's how I mm -hmm. choose to do it. I think that's also how libraries, for the most part, have proven their worth time and again, is that they have, there's a reason that we've always been around, and it's because we are reflective of the communities that we serve, we are responsive and respectful to those communities, and we try to shepherd a cultural trust going forward, so. And so, yeah, it was in, in my opinion that collective piece uh, reflects a lot of um, social justice work in Absolutely. amongst feminists. So the through line that we see across all four is this idea that what we need to do to think about the future, however you want to frame it, is collect information, make connections. Think of, isn't it Walt Whitman that's only connect? I think was one of the lines from his from he, Leaves of Grass. Was he on Project Runway? Well, Never. no. Okay, then I don't know. I know who he is, okay. We have to prioritize, and then ultimately we need to commit to action. So with the next few slides, Veranda and I wanted to talk through how we started to see like different opportunities to collect information, to start to make connections, to start to prioritize, and a call to action. And it's gonna be interesting to see if you can tell whose slides are whose. Well, they'll know that because of the person who talks about them. I know, but I them. bet you if we put the other <laughs> one up. Go ahead. Oh, no. No, fine, fine. Okay. <laughs> So, um, if you've ever seen me talk, one of the things I love to talk about is space, and specifically space from a retail and restaurant perspective. Because I am a retail kid, yes, like you, yes, Gap, you know, Yes. Okay. Well, I was Victoria's Secret. Separate yeah. competing companies, but that's okay. Okay, so I think we, we're seeing a lot of really interesting indicators about the future of semi-public space. Um, we see this movement of co-working that is really trying to figure out how to make very inviting collaborative spaces. This image in the upper left is from The Wing, which is a women's uh, co-working collective. Well, it's not women's only, but it's women first, I guess, in their collective. Um, and so they've created these very sort of posh, in a lot of ways, clubs and other spaces. Um, this particular image is from their library. Um, but they have a vision that women entrepreneurs, women uh, professionals can come into their spaces, work collectively, work together, start to build social networks, friendships, professional uh, relationships, and collegial uh, relationships that advance the place of women in society. And I coincidentally just uh, visited one I was telling Miguel last week. So the, the catch in all of this kind of is their membership. You have to pay to have a membership in those spaces, but they're creating the sort of public good that is tied and attached to a fee that you have to pay. They do have a sort of sliding scale that they see wherein they can allow non-members in for uh, semi-public events, lectures or talks or yeah. other types of things, but it really is sort of blurring this line of how do we work in these sort of collective third spaces. We see this movement of more and more restaurants that are trying to break into this idea of hang out, mess around, geek out in a very for-profit and business-driven space. So this image is from Sweet Green, the salad uh, restaurant that has popped up in uh, New York, DC, San Francisco, Chicago, and lots of other spaces. They sell these very nice salads and everything, but you can see the way that their seating is arranged. A lot of it is communal in nature. It's flexible. You go into some of their spaces and they have these tiered three seat uh, sort of bleachers that in the evenings they transition to have public performances, music, re uh, music performances, public readings and other types of things. So they for sure want you to come in and have a salad. 
but what they're really selling is this idea of social connection and an aspirational future that you can have where you're in the public, but you're not quite in the gritty public. You're in the nice public. In the nice public. In the nice public. And the best example of the nice public uh, might be this image um, uh, on the left. I'm sorry, on your, yeah, on your right. Yeah, over there. Um, this is Apple's rendering for its new store location in Washington, D.C. that is taking over the former Carnegie Library in D.C. Oh, I love the gasp. <laughs> yes! <laughs> you say it like that every time, yes. too. He's like, I'm going to show the slide of the Apple Library that is taking over the former Carnegie. Carnegie I mean, we're just Library. like talking about moving the slide. He's like, you mean the one of the <laughs> Apple store that's taking over the former Carnegie Library? Is that the slide you mean? So my previous thing about Apple was that they slowly rebranded their store concepts. It went from store, now it's this town square idea. They're actually marketing it as a town square. And their purpose is not just to sell and move product, but really to give people a place where they can come in, bring their computers, work. They can attend coding camps and coding classes. Does that sound familiar? They can That's do weird, huh? E that a public space would do that? Ebook clubs, performances and lectures. You can go in there and see an art installation. There are even meeting rooms that you can rent out and use for your own purposes. And there's the genius bar to provide a certain amount of instruction and guidance, maybe like a reference desk. I don't know. I don't know. So the weird thing that they did, though, with, with this DC location is that they purchased this from the city. And there are certain benefits that they are giving, they're purporting to give back to the community. N first of them was the restoration of this cultural asset. So they paid, I think, $30 million for the full restoration of what had previously been a, a publicly owned building. They also paid for the relocation of the Washington DC Historical Society that had previously been housed within this space. So they helped them move out of this space into a better space as part of the agreement that they made. The weird thing though is that they also have greater access to the open public park space that on which this library formerly sat on. So they not only inherit the building itself, but also this sort of third public space. And so all of these signs together, I think, point towards this concern that many of us should have about the privatization of public space. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not the formal acquisition of one's public spaces, the seeming blending of public-private starts to become of concern. It becomes concern especially because those people who can afford and feel themselves entitled to enter these spaces will opt to do so. And by doing so, they may then have less of a reason to interact in truly public spaces. They will substitute these interactions for their interactions in the general public, which is problematic. The other concern that we have is that these are not truly public spaces. Even though they are framed in this way, we know that they will prohibit certain people for any one of a number of characteristics <laughs> from entering and participating in those spaces. And so what happens to that? And then I think as we look towards the collective, what happens when our cities, our managers, whatever it may be, start to look and say, well, why do we need a library if we, we brought in Apple to provide this particular space? Or we will have, right now, we have a good portion of the public that values the public library or library spaces in, on campuses and schools because they're that third space. Will those individuals start to question and say, well, there's also this other opportunity for a third space. And so their, uh, their support for libraries might erode slightly as they start to conflate the opportunities that both of them offer. Oh, oh. we got a mic. And I would have had to get up here. No, you didn't. <laughs> so this mimicry also reminds me of like business improvement districts. Um, so it, and for those unfamiliar with BIDs, they're a blend of public and private monies um, to create like downtown and very specific districts that have this kind of very uniform cultural feel to them, but they actually are more private than public. For instance, um, one that I lived by for a while was Pacific Avenue, which is technically a mall in Santa Cruz. Um, so you can't do things like sit on the sidewalk or have a dog in this open air space. But yeah, like how do we deal with the, the w what I see around like futurist thinking and this mimicry of public and private? blending styles and you know what is our role in terms of teaching to to discriminate between the two and, and to differentiate 
So I think this uh, challenges us to articulate the true value of what we're offering in a new and different way. So we do have to distinguish and say, well, we can provide many of the services that perhaps an app Apple store is aspiring toward, but also that there's a fundamental value to having truly accessible public space, that that is one of the only things that drives true social mobility and economic mobility and development in most neighborhoods and communities, is that true intermingling and access of those spaces. And while these might be aspirational and they certainly help us rethink what we can pull from our spaces, we have to understand that they do not substitute for the fundamental value of the spaces that we offer. Their aesthetics may be ambitious, but the value of them is not the same that we're pursuing. And so part of it is a public relations message that we need to start sharing out and, and sharing in new and different ways. And I think that also goes back to, if I understand your, que your comment question correctly, um, how we were talking about the two streams of thought, back to Deb's point, around equity, diversion, and inclusion of not only do work teams get better um, and have more innovation with that, communities do. What? They get better? Yeah. yeah, communities do as well. And what civic engage, you know, you know, I always, in my experience, uh, the beauty when I, you know, I know, I'm sure other people do this too, go to other libraries when they're, somewhere and this idea of you know where else you know is that intersect you know is society really coming together um, and not just coming together to get your license or to get you know I'm just thinking of other agencies that are have the same uh, experience you know funding but where are we where is there true civic opportunity and, I'll, and as you said with the PR message, but how, I mean, I, this sounds super corporate, but how do we leverage that and ma show the, you know, really, sh as the outcome, what are the outcomes, us demonstrating the outcomes of those opportunities for civic engagement? I mean, I think we should also take a note, they want to be us. So there is something in that message mm -hmm. to start to talk to our funders, our advocates, and say, we're doing something right. You know what the difference is between that Apple store and another public library? The difference is money. So how totally. do we get money to funnel into the civic institutions that we have so that we can execute the full vision that they have? Because they didn't come up with all of this. They took a lot of it yeah. from other spaces. And so we need to start to use that not only as uh, a message of caution to our communities, but also as a message of we could all make, we could make this vision achievable and equitable for everyone if we have your support. Okay, so this is my slide. <laughs> so I love it. I'm here for you. You'd said 10 times you hate the, Car every time I said that, you're like, he, he just kept texting back, I hate the Kardashians. Then I'm like, this demonstrates that th I hate the Kardashians. Hate is a strong word, I didn't say you, that. Uh, do you want me to put the text up there? <laughs> okay. Um, so what this is our, and I like that we were calling our vision board of signals. And um, what, and I, you know, so mine, Dapper Dan, who, you know, what makes communities happy and did this th logos and community making things happen, you know, making this famous. And the reason I included him in that Project Runway experience, I also recently, I, I want to connect that to a documentary I watched about the first, the 100 Years of Vogue magazine. And um, Anna Wintour was the, uh, you know, queen of Vogue, was saying, you know, it used to be that haute couture and what was in the pages of our magazine determined fashion for people, whereas now, what's happening in, quote unquote, the street, the street and everywhere, you know, looking around, that pushes up what we have in Vogue. And uh, I say that to say Anna's wise words because that's happening in so many parts. That's a signal I see in other parts of our culture, um, how people get famous specifically. Um, I, I have a feeling there were not TV critics writing about the Kardashians and this is the show you should watch and here's a poignant message of our future. It's people, you know, loved this show. I 
from a voyeuristic standpoint, love it. Uh, but pushing up what became famous. And I specifically uh, wanted to include how much money each of them were worth uh, in this slide to show, I mean, you know, these are, you know, we can roll our eyes and, oh my God, I'd never watch that. Is she really a librarian? She likes this crap. But, I mean, this is real. And these, you know, as we look at the, and I love that when you talked about the history piece, the history of how libraries build collections, services, and programs. I think a lot of us, we did what we think, not, and the collective we, we think people need as opposed to what they want. Um, there's a great training that I attended 100 years ago, and I would love to do it again. Maybe I should work at Khalifa and try to make that happen, um, called Bridges Out of Poverty. Do you guys already, everyone here already knows the training is. Like in the Midwest, I was a genius. Um, what that training is about is sometimes, and they applied it to libraries, like, let's have a retirement program. It's like, girl, I'm trying to get to work today and make sure my kid has childcare. You know, let's do a program with, you know, um, a Walt Whitman book. It's like, how does that, con I'm not making fun of you. But, you know, how does that connect to the lives of the communities we serve? But really letting the people drive, you know, and if that means, and I, my past job, I ran a statewide ebook platform. So, yeah, we had 50 Shades of Grey, and y'all do too, I'm sure, if in publics and probably in some academics, 50 Shades of Grey in multiple, I mean, that's what people want to read. And even how that book, in terms of the self-published market, you know, you know, there's always there's a tension in my ebook life of, well, it doesn't have a review, we can't get it, sorry, good luck, but really cr changing the system of how can we serve people with w what they want and what they're requesting, and not just what we think they we need or what the system we've perpetuated of how we buy, like that's not in a. Uh, Title Source 360 is what I use. You know, whatever, and everyone's like, and everyone having a little PTSD, if you're me. But yeah, those systems that we've perpetuated, not just in collections, but in other ways of how these things happen, the history of how we've developed it, and how we can change it to do it differently. And how, not just what we have, but how we serve our communities. So, and Jeffree Star is a, YouTube makeup expert, and again, it's not, you know, and, and even, and you see brands doing this now with CoverGirl and all these other, you know, really having not only inclusive models and size in non-binary to whatever, to really showcasing to boys in makeup, like what it means, they're following you know, people on YouTube who are, that's what people want to see and that's who they want to emulate and how these, what channels are making these people famous, I guess, is the other, the media, uh, social media is where it's coming from. So that's my signal. I mean, so I think, uh, I totally agree. I think this feeds into a larger trail of the general diminishment of expertise mm -hmm. across society and culture. I mean, they are one manifestation of this, is that there is no one dictating the official yeah. uh, uh, coronation of culture in our society. I wouldn't call anymore. it diminishment. I'd call it a disbursement. That's true, yeah. yeah. But I, I guess um, where I, I come from still, mm -hmm. my vulnerable insecurities. And so part of me looks at this and feels like I went and went through grad school and everything else with a sense that at some point I would become expert in something. Mm -hmm. And what this and other systems are really telling us in a lot of ways is that that idea of expertise, we have to have a certain amount of humility to let go of some of that mm -hmm. and to listen to what people really need yeah. and recognize that the expertise that we actually need to develop is one of facilitation, yeah. one of listening, one of trying to figure oh, those so things out. What, you know, it's just before you, uh, that's interesting. Uh, there's uh, someone I follow on the Twitter, Chris Borg, who's a, and I keep saying these academic librarians, but uh, 
they there she does a lot of work around uh, open access and uh, opening up resources in academia which are so out of control but this new collective of academics that are working to do this together in their manifesto is like is and I need to find it again always uh, listening and ready to lead so and I think that is a good signal of what uh, how we need to work in the future that as you were saying that facilitation is more important than a sage on a stage kind of an expert like us <laughs> we are the past thank you the talk is done <laughs> um, I like I love the idea of having like more pop culture and more um, uh, what some people would consider trash in the library. Um, Did you just call me trash? No, because I love, like, I, I remember people telling me, like, oh, why are people reading Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, why are you reading Harry Potter? How is that? <laughs> I mean, I like reading Beowulf. Like, yeah. some people think that's trash. It, But at the same time, how do you tell people, also educate, have those in your collection, but, like, point out that Jeffree Star is a like blatant racist and yeah. that the Kardashians are not actually self-made mm -hmm. millionaires and um, Fifty Shades of Grey is actually a really bad example of yeah. everything it has in it. So how do you have... <laughs> yeah. So we were uh, talking about this. Remember the piece we were talking about? We've chosen these very surface examples in terms of signal, or I have, you probably would say, uh, surface examples of signals, and that, you know, and there, you know, are some are problematic in nature, but that really, this isn't what it's, you know, this is just like, we need to dig deeper in terms of what signals are and what they can, what impact they could truly have on our communities. So I think that's the piece we were going to move to next. So let me also just say though, um, facilitation is not neutral. So what these are examples of what has happened when unmediated mm -hmm. um, systems have just allowed whatever to popularize to popularize. No one has at any point come in and said, okay, you've watched this or that, let's get you to the next thing, let's do this. And so, I mean, I think that that's one of the challenges that libraries have had in their long history is that originally we were supposed to be nonfiction collections that were supposed to be for the improvement of people. No fiction, no nothing. Um, people said they wanted fiction. We brought fiction into our collections. But I don't think we just allowed that to exist unmediated. We started to say, okay, how do we leverage this fiction? How do we leverage series fiction? How do we leverage audiobooks? How do we leverage DVDs, blah, 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 into a larger vision of the values that we have? So I think you're absolutely right that, you know, there are terrible elements to some of these things. What we need to figure out is, okay, how do we harness the good elements from these and leverage them for our more productive futures? These are the signals there's positive and negative forecasts that we can expand out from these things. And it's all about the learning and actions that we execute in the present to shift them towards our positive ends and goals. Yeah. And as we experience signals like these, how do we leverage them to start con spark conversations across groups? And not just spark conversations when people are at home talking about it, but how can our, how can the library bring new conversations to the table as people are consuming these signals and what they mean. And not like, here's what you should think about this, but here are perspectives around this, I think is the most important piece. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, she, there's, uh, here's a mic. I was going to use the introduction to mention this because I was also someone who would criticize the Kardashians in the past because I didn't, understand or I wasn't interested but um, because Kim Kardashian was the main impetus behind the First Step Act which is one of mm -hmm. the major criminal justice reforms I think that we can all agree has been <laughs> yeah. you know just monumental she kind of became someone I needed to follow up on and I'm slowly learning to have respect for her <laughs> yeah 
So I just wanted to mention that part because Thank it you. ties into like, But it is, it's on. like, it's complicated. It's, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, by no means do I want it to sound like these people are great. They're, you know, this is what we should have, everything about them. But these things are complicated, you know, and uh, what role can we play in unpacking just what you're describing? The and when people are using their platform for something that that can create that kind of change, then that's when I listen up and I kind of like mm -hmm. get out of my Walt Whitman world. <laughs> well, I, so I think one of the things that I really appreciate about what you said is that we do have to remain curious about looking at these things, even if our gut reaction for whatever may be, it may be is to dismiss them is that we have to kind of maintain that sense of like, I'm gonna keep learning about this because maybe things will change. Maybe I'll just learn something new that reinforces what I already believed, but also perhaps it might expand understanding to change that perception. Um, and that that's that through line of being curious, continuing to be inclusive, and keep thinking about things in different ways. I, I know you don't wanna talk about it right now, but the thing we were talking about also is not just doing it around things you in that you like and enjoy like i don't i mean where i mean make up you know i'm not looking at personally at a lot of youtube beauty stars i mean i think it's interesting but it's outside of my experience that I, my personal passion so uh this idea of really using it as an opportunity you know as we talk about the communities we serve, it's not just what we personally are interested in, though that for me, it can be a gateway to some things, but to really step outside of that, to, to look at signals outside what you do all, what your thing is, your jam is. Okay, so I'm an ILL person, so we're gonna talk about access and delivery, because that's what I like. Um, so I think there's lots of interesting signals out there about how people are going to both expect to receive things and the level of convenience that is going to come to them. And I think the signals themselves teach us both something about how it might improve the position of the library, but also challenge the position of the library. So in the upper left, uh, we have an example of Amazon's book box program, which is one of several growing subscription service delivery programs that are coming out, not only from Amazon, but from you know Blue Apron, Trunk Club, any one of a number of things. Um, the marked difference in this isn't simply that things are being delivered to people's doorsteps. I think the change that's starting to happen and perhaps what we might want to be interested in is the fact that people are willing to sign up in advance of knowing the content that they will receive, provided that the service can bank on a certain amount of expertise. If you look at how Amazon Book Box framed their value proposition, it wasn't just that you would get three books every month for your specific aged child. It was that Amazon's editors and buyers were specifically selecting the best of both classic children's books and newly pub published children's books. If you look at Blue Apron, they trade heavily on an idea that it's chef prepared meals. It's centering expertise of culinary experts. If you look at Trunk Club, you're assigned a stylist to help you pick the clothes that you want. So that individual is leveraging their expertise to deliver something to you that will be both delightful and convenient. So I think when we think about this in a world that's seen a lot of shifts in how people value expertise, this is one of the few indicators that there's also a growing respect for individuals who market themselves as expert if you can develop a relationship with them in the long term. Can I? Um, so, and one thing uh, that personally I'm very interested in is how can we leverage the expertise of librarians to increase the value proposition of us in relation to the uh, retail market? He's coming right now, uh, is a big thing. Where, again, I talked about the ebook stuff that I did briefly, and we did an e content strategy. And with something it's similar to in our collection development, our goal was how can we create access, content, experience, and delight. So, and that spells aced, by the way, if anyone's paying attention. 
Um, but how can we, you know, leverage our expertise as these retail partners do, or partners, do to uh, really deliver that? And I think we've not uh, kicked up our game in articulating that. You know, I know it's inherently people believe that about our programs and everything else. I'm talking about books right now. But I think there are a lot of ways we could uh, elevate that, with, you know, just as they do in their advertising. So I think there is a comment. I was going to give you an example uh, locally of the random, the uh, blind date with a book club mm -hmm. yeah. at the uh, Mechanics Institute Library. There's also a... Um, in Memoirs of a Bookseller, which is a hysterically funny book by a Scots bookseller, he's got a random book club where he sends people, you know, they have no idea what they're going to be getting, but more often than not, they love the books, they keep them, they pay money for them in the long run. Yeah. And uh, I think that there's a science fiction book club, bookstore in San Francisco that's beginning to do that too. Science fiction, by the way, is a great way to stretch your mind around the future. Yeah, that's very true. Yep. So I mean, I think we there's lots of ex I, so we all know in public libraries, especially readers advisory remains a popular service, and when people know uh, have a trusted expert in readers advisory, they're willing to come back to them. One of the other ones, though, is children's story time. People don't know what stories are going to be shared, but they develop an awareness that the Library Experience workers are too. expert in delivering those story times and they have a trusted relationship mm -hmm. that they will go not knowing too much, but knowing that there will be something great that happens at the story map. Yes. Uh, many years ago, when I was trained as a librarian, they talked about the reference interview. Mm -hmm. And that's gone by the wayside, particularly with programs where librarians are trained through online programs. They don't you know, for two years they're just doing things through a computer and not actually face-to-face -face talking to people. So we used to build a relationship with an individual in the community and people knew what types of books they liked, they knew what they wanted to read, and as you're saying, they developed that relationship where, oh, Mr. So-and-so, he always wants mysteries or whatever. And the, the tendency has gone away from that. And I think it's unfortunate. You know, I think uh, those, thank you, first of all, but those relationships occur in different ways online. Um, and people build, there are people who uh, I've never seen before, but I trust their taste. Um, former teen editor of Vogue, his name is Philip Picardi. And first of all, if you ever saw my Twitter with his, it's like I have liked almost every comment. But when he recommends something, because I'm watching what he says, I think there are ways, and I think librarians, I think we can translate our trust to uh, online mediums as well. And I, I think, and people have. Um, I, I'm sure libraries here have done it too, but there's, a, I, I know NYPL did it, and some libraries in Illinois, uh, you know, we were talking about watch, the hashtag watch this, read that. Are you guys, I'm, some of you I'm sure are familiar with that, of uh, just libraries going to Twitter and uh, connecting movies that are being talked about with what people should read if they like that movie. And the, um, you know, so I think we can build that expertise in other mediums that we did in that face-to-face, -face, just like people are doing now with that, those, uh, that disbursement of expertise. But I, wa I want to roll with what you're thinking because I think you're recognizing a very significant threat that is inherent in a lot of the other signals that are up on this board. So l let me just uh, uh, roll through some of these. So we're also starting to see this movement of these sort of locker pickup stations. This, was, this is Amazon's locker program. So Amazon, uh, of course, will deliver to your home or office, but some people, for any one of a number of security reasons or other issues, um, they've introduced an option where they can deliver to these online, to these lockers. Basically, you place your order, you designate the uh, box to which you want it delivered locally in your city or, or uh, geographic area, and they deliver there. You're given a code and you go up and access that particular item. Um, they've expanded this program away from just convenience stores. They're now in a lot of their Whole Foods markets. They have a partnership now they with Chase. They have it Chase in my apartment building. With we Chase. Do, we have that. My high-rise. 
they've also rolled this out to high-rise and high-capacity uh, residences, like apartments and condos, to actually manage their package receiving. We're talking about thousands of people who, in certain communities, don't have the internet, don't have computers, yeah. don't can't get stuff delivered or be stolen in like 10 minutes. So that leaves out a whole segment of many communities. So I think that is absolutely true. I think the thing that I'm concerned about, and perhaps what I was very interested in your earlier comments about, is that it also disassociates the humans who are responsible for the delivery of services from the receipt of the goods that are provided. And that's a really big challenge. As we talk about you know, the value of a relationship with a human being to understand how this service is fulfilled and to have that relationship, we're seeing a lot of indicators that they're just moving away with these. Amazon is moving to their Amazon Prime will start to shift from two day free delivery to single day free delivery. So they're expediting their entire shipping process. It's made possible, of course, by the automation of many of their warehouses and the cheapening of labor as they deliver things out into communities. But it's also acclimating consumers towards this idea that if you can afford it, you can have all the conveniences of the world and none of the human connection or burden. And we're gonna have to start to figure out how we adjust those types of things. Now the locker program, um, several libraries have actually adopted those. Um, academic institutions, universities and colleges have them, and many academic libraries are actually using them for holds and reserves. Uh, public libraries are using them for online holds and reserves. Um, a library in Kansas actually put one in their high V grocery store so that people can go online, request the book, and pick it up when they go and purchase their grocery stores. Uh, when they go and purchase their groceries. The challenge that we have, of course, is one of both how do we manage access to that? Not everybody can have all of their materials in that way. And also, do we want to proceed with a model of service that removes human labor from it? Let me just show the, the last example is uh, the book bot from, I'm sorry, which library? Mountain View, Mountain View Public Library um, here in California. So, so um, oh, did you just say, I want one of the, <laughs> I love that you just, Put so, that in the universe. So Starship Technologies, which is the firm that manufactures these robots, um, has worked with legislatures in seven states. Uh, Washington was the most recent to legalize the delivery of the, legalize the movement of these bots on sidewalks and crosswalks across their states. And so it's becoming easier and easier for them to use these for delivery. Um, this library has used it to deliver to homebound patrons or, or patrons who just choose to have their books delivered to their house. Um, I thought it was interesting when we first started to see this, especially on library Twitter, I think there was a certain amount of people who said, I want this, it's interesting. There were a lot of other people who frankly hated it. They hated the idea that they were removing humans from a very human exchange and transaction. And especially for homebound patrons, for whom that interaction with a homebound delivery person might be their only opportunity to see someone that day or week, this was particularly concerning. And so again, I think we'll have to figure out, and I'm sure this library is figuring it out as they go, is how do we make sure that the people who want this convenience have this convenience, but understand the human labor that goes behind it? And then also, how do we make sure that people who want the human contact have the opportunity to have access to these services without just the automated version of it in a different way? So we have to figure out all of those types of things together as we start to assemble these signals into how we integrate them into our future. Click. Oh, do you want to? to oh, there. Here comes Brian. Brian, you are just working it. I just want to say I would I would like to have this in my building. Mm -hmm. um, the people request that we get a book. We walk our little buns over, usually to this library, to pick it up. I work at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a few blocks away, mm -hmm. and it's quite the neighborhood to walk through. And then the book sits at the reference desk for sometimes 24, 48 hours before the person who wants it is disentangled enough from their work to come down and get it. And oftentimes we will deliver it to them, but they're in chambers and we can't always sure. get back to see them. Oh, totally. And so having this little bot 
deliver it would actually be a connection. Kind of the opposite. Mm. Man, I love some library people. Because, <laughs> well, so this is the thing that I love about what you just did, is that I think that you took this indicator and you didn't just say, how would it make my life easier? I think mm -hmm. you saw it as an opportunity to improve the general transaction. The and experience, I, yeah. And this is what it is all about, is trying to figure out how do we bring these things in and figure out how they are best used to our values and purposes. Not to make life easier for us or anything else, but to really increase the value mm -hmm. for communities. So, value I mean, yeah. then the goal becomes, well, okay, how do we explore this bot? How do, do we figure all of these things out? What do we have to work with in our buildings to make that future a reality? So. <laughs> yes, I know. I think you're going to steal one. I, I, yeah, and you're at a court, so maybe you could get a break. So, I mean, I get that these indicators are here and, and you do see it all over the place, And but there's also a concurrent conversation happening around loneliness <gasps> and That's our connection. Steal our jam. Oh. <laughs> Go, yes. No. Man, I love me some library people. Because we see these things and we see, you're doing it. You're on Shut it. Shut up. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna hand no, this No! No, oh, okay. Can right. you? All right. Let's go. Okay, well, um, <laughs> that, what is your name? Who are you? Uh, go? From the future. I, Jessica from the future. <laughs> um, well, even though, uh, you, you know, when we were talking about this, this, this signals of mine, um, I feel like you were pointing out that I'm lonely, but we can talk about that <laughs> late. And now Jessica's pointing out that I'm lonely, and I, I don't know how I'm feeling about all of this. Um, so anyway, so uh, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar. These are YouTube, or shows I watch on YouTube. And um, they're, what I, I was like, why, I am, so, I am inherently nosy, and I love eavesdropping, which none of you will ever want to be near me on any public, or near me at ALA or anything, because I just love eavesdropping. And things like this have, uh, like eating with, an, my, eating with my ex is, have, does anyone seen this show? <laughs> yeah, I know, it, that's what I mean. It's so awkward, it's awesome. <laughs> that people, uh, a cup, uh, exes come together and, uh, and, the, and I was playing with Miguel, I know you, <laughs> oh, I, no kidding, you don't know this. But when I was trying to explain it to you, I sensed eye roll, I could feel your eye roll through the phone. Um, so what it is, and a piece of the plate is covered up, and, it's, and each course is a question for the other person. <laughs> Watch it. So it's like, did you cheat on me? And the, and the, and the waiter takes the napkin off. Did you cheat on? And they say in a British accent, though. Did you cheat on me? And the person has to answer the question, and then the other one, uh, you know. So and they just do this course and have a conversation, and then it ends with the dessert is sometimes, do you want to get back together with me? I mean, I could throw up right now thinking about my asking people I've dated, I, I want to die right now. But you're watching other people do it. I love it! <laughs> and, um, yeah, and this, uh, this uh, you know, some of them are also around watching people's first dates, and I'm always, when I'm out with people and I'm eavesdropping, I'm like, I wonder, this is the third date? Wait, what date are th this is? And it, Dating No Filter, which is an American show, and hilarious. Um, so it's like, it's this phenomenon, which is a new T, in my experience, new TV phenomena of people, you're watching people watch it. And so their first dates that you're watching people comment on the first date. But this idea of like media, social media kind of feeding into, and when I was saying, oh, this is feeding into our voyeurism, okay, this is back to you, Jessica. So this was like, this feeds into our voyeurism and we could do it so much more openly. And Miguel goes, I think it's about loneliness. And I'm like, 
what, shut up all of you, because that means, but this idea of, well, okay, let's talk about the loneliness. That, I mean, not my loneliness, <laughs> but, and, and you were saying, I didn't read the article, could you, that New York Times article. So last week, I think the New York Times did an article about the n level and number of services that are now being introduced to address loneliness. Um, that uh, not only the co-working spaces and other things, but they're like Bumble, the, the dating yeah. app Bumble, also has a version that's BFF, which is for women to find other women to befriend and sort of expand their social circles. Um, there's just lots of different elements. And I think a lot of these are also trying to mm -hmm. feed into that idea of how do you, oh, co-living spaces, wherein people are renting smaller and smaller individual living spaces to trade and exchange for larger social spaces yeah. and a built-in social network. Uh, especially for people who are moving to New York or San Francisco, uh, wherein they may not know anyone else, they will pay a premium to have that sort of built-in social network in their building. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is just trading on loneliness. Yeah. Why are you looking at me? Well, because you're watching me. But uh, so even think about our young people, though, the amount of people who now, w the amount of kids who watch other kids play video games mm -hmm. on YouTube, the unboxing phenomenon, you know, especially for yes. young children and kids, it is this idea of watching someone who is like you do something that you likely want to do, and you're doing it, for the most part, these young people are doing it alone. And so I think as public <laughs> spaces and libraries, we need to prepare ourselves for perhaps an epidemic of loneliness if it's not already here. Okay. It is already here, yeah. Oh, the person. Oh, go ahead, person behind Jessica. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. I, I want to just connect on that too. And well, it's about connection, right? Yes. It's not just loneliness, but connection with other people, like you said, Miguel, who are like you. I mean, I watched The Masked Singer. I don't know if any of you watch that. You know, B-level kinds of celebrities <laughs> trying to figure out who these masked singers were. Oh, they were in yeah. like in costumes and stuff like uh -huh. that. And because celebrity now is so big, it dwarfs like even like reality television. Mm -hmm. So you need to connect with people who are not even famous, really, mm -hmm. because then it's then it becomes a more interactive process. So it's just interesting to hear all of this because it's about connection and trying to find some platform upon which you can uh, connect with not just the experience of people watching these mass singers, but like other people like, oh, who do you think that mass singer was? Who is that, mm -hmm. that bumblebee? <laughs> so um, one of my go-to stories about this is that I, I think Fast Company had this article a year or two ago about these two guys who went into a Starbucks and they went into the Starbucks on Monday and had the intent to stay there all week. So they went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they saw all these people who were working side by side and would just come in day after day and work and work and work. And finally on Thursday or Friday, they decided we're gonna go and ask them what they're working on. And they went up to the people and the report out in Fast Company said that I think 90% of those individuals, number one, were happy to tell them what they were working on. But more surprisingly, they said, they had been waiting for someone to ask them what they were doing. Yeah. Like, because, and I had a children's librarian who explained it to me. She said that young people engage it, is it parrot play? Where they like, they mimic what the child next to them is doing, whether they know why or not. And she said that a lot, a lot of adults also engage in that, in our formation of lines or other types of things. But even at a Starbucks, or perhaps even in many of our public spaces, um, academic or, or, or public libraries, People come in and they see everyone else working by themselves on a laptop and closing that laptop and leaving. And so their assumption is, is that this is a space where you just do quiet, alone together work. You're working alone, but you're together in a public space. And what those, those individuals were trying to point to is that even if people come in and parrot that day after day, that perhaps their larger need is one of connection. connection. They would have been happy to engage in that connection, but somebody has to broker that. Somebody has to be there to actually facilitate that discussion. You want to that? Sure. Okay, so we're done with our collected signals. Let me put a caveat on what we did. So we tried to show how we collect pieces of information, those signals, 
try to establish the patterns that run through those things and understand how they might fit into library priorities. The confession that I will say that we kind of recognized last night especially was that many of these signals come from a pri largely privileged perspective. These are the luxuries of public space, the luxuries of service and delivery. And as I think as our audience member pointed out, libraries are confronting some very difficult realities. I know San Jose just did their homeless census and they found an increase in homelessness, people experiencing homelessness over the past year. And so not only are there good signals and indicators or fun signals and indicators, but there are some very negative societal, environmental, economic indicators that we're all starting to deal with. So what we wanted to do with the next amount of time was to talk amongst ourselves about, well, what are some of the other signals that we're seeing? Um, so some of us have already shared some things, but we're challenging you to think about things that you've noticed outside of your library work that have kind of made you go, hmm, what's changing in this world? And then maybe we can all talk together about how those have resonance in libraries and how those indicate larger patterns um, across society. So. Anyone noticing things that they're like, I've been noticing this. Oh, good, a volunteer. Thank you. Just one second. He's, he's, he's running. He's, 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 go faster. Libraries, have, especially public libraries, have become more of social services, and staff is not trained. Yeah. Elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. Absolutely. So uh, this, the signal really has been that more and more people are, are coming into public libraries as a last resort for social services because cities and governments have underfunded traditional social services. Absolutely. Well, as a former social worker, um, and I'm the Spanish translator here in San Francisco Public Libraries, and I, before I worked in literacy in San Mateo County Libraries, um, what I'm seeing is even though the theory is there, there are people doing the work. It, it happens in pockets. And I think what I'm seeing and what I adore is that people that I heard librarians that I used to work with, oh, these people can't come into the library. And with the programs I was doing, I started listening to what their needs were and make them, make the space more safe for them. Now they're, the star volunteers, their children, their high risk has gone down and they're always at the library. And I'm seeing little pockets of cultures changing within libraries. And then those librarians are showcasing those programs and these volunteers and these at risk communities that were the problem people in the libraries being showcased um, at big events in CLA, ALA. And I think. Um, you know, you, you, there's these big ideas, but the work starts in small pockets. And I like that you bring all this pop culture because we can't ignore that. Those yeah. are big waves and they're part of the people's lives that come into the libraries every day. And so we can't ignore And there are things people connect to. Exactly, and the connection, 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 connection. So you have to see what motivates a person and how can I leverage that to open their world a little mm -hmm. bit more without being condescending, with respecting where they're coming from. Uh, you don't need to know every culture, you don't need to know every language, but you need to have the skills to be able to listen to the other. I, I wanna, um, it's cause that's uh, what you're talking about. Um, the where I, my background is academic libraries and I worked at the University of Illinois at Chicago and where it's located in Chicago unfortunately used to be because they, it's gone now, across the street, the library was directly across the street from public housing. And, um, and I, when I would work at night, kids would run through the library. And um, my, I used to have go to the library with my mom when she was working on her masters. And so I'm like, God, we suck. We don't have anything for kids. So um, I said, and so I said to these kids, listen, you have to come say hi to me every time you come in this library from now on. And you know, I have a teacher voice, so they did. <laughs> and uh, um, some of them, and of course, you know, again, this is uh, academic, but I taught some of them how to use, and this is a long time ago, InfoTrack. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm dating myself. But, uh, and it became, it became so hilarious, because I get a call from our reserve desk 
in the first floor and this little girl, cause I showed her how to find where everything was. And so she wanted to get the magazine, but she couldn't even see over the counter. <laughs> and it became her library is my point. And I, and she loved, it was all about Tupac Shakur. And fortunately, InfoTrack has a lot on Tupac Shakur. But, um, you know, and it, it became a way to talk, for me to talk to her and to get to know her and for her to say, you know, they want, my school wants me to go to a different school, but my friends are at this school. And it was a acceleration program. And I said, I know, that's scary, because I moved away too from everybody I know. And you know, the same kind of, and I say this to say, you know, some may say, that's not the role of a academic live, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, I think it's, imp I mean, that's our future user. And part of my goal when I was an academic library was to demystify higher ed to people who live next door to it, especially. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and to t kind of uh, and that signal of those kids not having an opportunity to uh, have uh, a another space to go. And there was a, actually a public library in the same neighborhood, but I don't know what their experience, and they may not have been able to go there without a parent or something at night. But yeah, it's just really interesting how you could you those pockets and leverage them to uh, do to really support each other as humans more than anything else. I have a question. Ah, that's the microphone too. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk more about um, two ideas you guys brought up. One is that the, lo the library, the public libraries are providing social services to a certain extent. And we also talked about the development of things that are a lot like libraries, but mm -hmm. they're not gonna have that social services mm -mm. aspect in them. So I think that this needs to get talked about or worked on or it's going to continue. You know what I mean? Like there's a force where people are coming in, you know, who are somewhat homeless or whatever. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. <laughs> um, in need of social support. And other people who might u want to use something like a library are uncomfortable with that. Um, do you have a, any ideas about how we're going to resolve that? So I think... Um, the, the line of thinking that you have is one of my concerns about what's happening with uh, stores like Apple or even Starbucks or anything else is that, and I'm gonna have to tread carefully here because, so if a certain category of people stop coming to public libraries and instead opt to go to another private space, private space, my concern becomes that the public library becomes inundated with individuals who then see it as a vacated space into which they can do any one of a number of things from loitering, disruptive behavior, violent behavior in those spaces, et cetera, other things. Part of what happens is that our, uh, the the civilized work, the civilized space that we have, that we create is part of the social contract we have to other, pe to other people. Now, that is se a separate issue from people who have actual needs. So that's, that's not to say that, you know, other people won't continue to come into our library who have valid, real mental health, um, economic needs, and other types of things. But if many of our functions now become but many of our staff functions become focused on um, managing disruptive behavior instead of delivering services, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And I think that that's what we hear from a lot of libraries right now, is the fact that our society is uh, splitting, is that the library has become this sort of disruptive catch-all, and we can't sift through the people who have actual valid needs from the people who are there just to loiter, to disrupt, and, and to do other things, so that's a concern. The positive sign, and where I think we're, we're going back to, to the comment that was shared back there about, you know, that there has been this depletion of social services and other types of things, I think we are starting to see many libraries move towards models where they either co-locate or house uh, non-library professionals in more of a social service capacity. I know this library was one of the first to hire a nurse. 
other uh, institutions have hired a social worker. So I'm, I'm sorry, social worker. Pima County in Arizona was the one that hired a nurse. I'm sorry, a public health nurse. Um, so we're starting to see those types of models. I think we start to see other types of models in other, especially large urban libraries, where they're starting to figure out how to hotel specific workforce development communities. Phoenix Public Library has College Depot, which is all about college advising, especially for individuals who have matriculated out of the normal um, K-12 and higher ed pipeline and other types of things. They're not focusing as much on making their library staff universal in what they can provide. They're recognizing that library staff have a very specific purpose and other disciplines and specializations have another purpose, but they can be housed within a larger umbrella of the library. And we see this trend not only within libraries, but a lot of other city agencies and other departments and other nonprofits and organizations. And we need to let go of some of our proprietary sense of like only, the library can only hire library people. I think that idea has gone in a lot of ways. Um, I completely agree with that, that we need to do more collaborations. Um, it's unrealistic to expect library staff and librarians to uh, have the ability to do their work and also the work of social workers and everything else. But I think that there's a, we typically think of going to our personal security before we think of those collaborations that could prevent the need for those security. Um, but I also, it's a slippery Isn't that a hard thing to say? <laughs> yeah. It is a really hard thing to say. And, um, but how you said, like, we need to think of less having people who are also not library people in the library is kind of a slippery slope at times because we see libraries starting to have more IT people who do not have the same kind of mindset that we have or then it becomes that public and private place. A lot of times they're making decisions that impact what I would say our ethos as an agency. I think, uh, I, I, as a P, I mean, I don't know what I mean by this. I do know what I mean, but we don't have a lot of time. Um, have to up our great game and start bragging more. Yeah, I really don't think we do that enough about, <laughs> keep going, you see, that's why you should be up here, um, our impact and the contribution and the role we play in that civic space and creating uh, residents that can, that participate uh, in a diverse society, so the role we can play doing that. I don't think we talk about that enough at all. Uh, well, some, I'm sure somebody is, and I just don't know. But I, th I mean, I think there's a challenge of humility in what you just said, is that we also have to, uh, we have to confront our own egos and ask ourselves, mm -hmm. is this strict adherence towards the primacy of our profession? Is that in the best interest of our users and community? And that's a tough thing to confront. Yeah. I think the thing that we need to start bragging about and perhaps recentering is the professional values that guide these organizations, okay. that it cannot be run by anyone. It needs to be run by people who are aligned with a specific core set of values mm -hmm. that have shepherded this profession for generations, mm -hmm. I these think institutions we're, for generations. We're very good at bragging to each other. Yep. I don't think we're very good at bragging in government um, and open public places or people who don't necessarily come to the library who um, might see us as obsolete, we definitely need to get into those spaces outside of our comfort areas oh, exactly. and stop being in this echo chamber of how great we are. Totally. I want you to run for president. <laughs> I seriously would right now. I'm thinking about Eric Kleinenberg's book and, and the social infrastructure thing. I, I think one, one big brain thing, maybe not for you guys, maybe you've been doing this a long time, but I really want to figure out how to bring together people who don't meet one another in their general lives, but they do have shared interests and, mm -hmm. and help them build mm -hmm. communities yes. in our libraries. And uh, one example that, you know, if people have story time, we have little deaf kids 
who come to an ASL baby story time. And the thing that has been so fascinating and wonderful to me is to see that the parents come together then. They meet each other and talk about what the their network. kids are doing in yeah. school. And one dad saying, oh, yeah, when, when my daughter rode her bus for the first time, they let me ride along, and it's cool, and this is how, you know, the, the staff treat them. Just seeing communities of people who have shared concerns and shared interests come together in the library, I think, is really important, making a place for mm -hmm. that to happen. Just like we, we were talking about the connections we make for our communities with the services and information we have, but really uh, leveraging that as an opportunity to make those connections between people um, who may not have connected any other way. And let me just, I, I think that a lot of this process of spotting signals, of trying to identify trends and changes, gives us the capacity to start to understand the other sectors, the other disciplines, the other professions that are aligned or in contrast to our goals and objectives and gives us a guiding, park, a guiding point of saying, we need to reach out to this group because they share something with the overall values that we have. But so part of Futuring isn't just about thinking about that prediction, it's also trying to give us the language to advocate for the futures that we want. I think uh, a big trend that I'm seeing that is very effective is doing library services outside of library buildings, uh, especially for marginalized communities and communities that traditionally do not come to a library, um, doing things like going to the American Legion on Friday night and giving library cards and having books to give away. Uh, uh, things like that, going to bars where intellectuals meet and the people pay to go there and hear somebody talk and the library is there and we're doing button making and things like that. These are all examples of things that are fun and, and it gives librarians a stage with the people. You don't have to think about a great program and you have a library and nobody shows up. Everybody's there and your expertise is there. So, uh, and people start recognizing the value of the library in ways that they didn't think about. Because we're very, w we work so hard, librarians work so hard uh, that the marketing part normally is like the last thing. Um, so we wanted to just wrap up uh, by talk and then make sure we have time for questions and comments. But a couple of things, so how do we keep the line between the future and the present going and continuous? Um, Try your best to be open. Um, that includes trying to evaluate and reevaluate the social value of the Kardashians or other celebrities. <laughs> but having that, having that openness to think about things that you don't like, things that you think are disassociated from your professional work, whatever it may be. Be inclusive and collaborative. I think that's something that we all need to continue to do. Um, remain curious, try to be respectful. I think sometimes it's very hard for, it's very easy for us to dismiss or shut down a signal, but there's, a, we have entire collections that are respectful to human knowledge in its multiple forms. We need to embrace that same amount of respect in the ways that we look at our world and the changes that are happening. And then to be intentional. Um, Two ways that we can exercise this in practice. How can we change our cultures both personally and organizationally? Um, in practice, I think for a personal uh, commitment that you can make, and perhaps you don't need to make all of these commitments, but a good way to orient yourself towards the future is to think of how do you make time for discovery intentionally? Um, that's a tough one, especially because we all have a full schedule of work, but trying to carve out time, maybe it's the first 10 or 15 minutes when you get into the office, trying to figure out, well, I'm going to make room to learn something new, even just a snippet of something new, than what I don't know already. Make it a practice, it only works if you do it intentionally. Look for those patterns that you see. One-offs are great, but as you start to look and think about things intentionally, you'll notice different patterns happening. Know your own interests and start to build a network. I don't watch pop culture, thank God you do, but. Um, I mean, I watch, I do pop culture, but I don't watch reality TV, I so thank you God you do. I go to every concert in America, I go to and a lot other of concerts, countries. But, 
and then ask people what they are interested in. So this is one of the saddest things that I often notice is that in a lot of our organizations, the people who get to chime in about the important things going on have a certain rank or title or responsibility. And I'm often confronted by individuals who say, I'm 22 years old, I know a lot of what's happening for 22 year olds and I could be informative to programming, but my job title here is Page or Shelver or this or that, and I'm never asked a question. We really don't wanna be those people. Everyone on our organizations has inherent value, knowledge, and wisdom. And it does require us to go and ask people, what are you interested in? What are you noticing that's happening here? Members of the organizational? Meh. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I do think uh, that's a piece that I'm always, it's like that, again, getting to action is the other piece. So even if it's like a snippet of, a t and I was doing it as, okay, people in an organization may agree that this is something like maybe some of you are here from the same organization. Um, how can we put this on just our team weekly meeting? Um, it, uh, and I haven't, my fabulous colleague Christian is here, so he's like, you don't do that. But I do because our team meetings, I try to, uh, and we only work with four people, but put uh, an article for us to discuss that's outside of libraries. Um, and what this means for the libraries we serve it, in a small way, how we do that, to create a point of discussion around these signals or around the observations that we're having, so just even just uh, if it's 10 minutes, and how can we, as that goes, how can we move it forward? Um, keeping that, you know, you can, mo I, most of us, we, you can see what we're talking about. Um, but then starting to build those stories uh, and, you know, as we talked about the importance of diversity on teams, the diversity of different signals and what people are seeing, similar to the person who is 22, similar to people who may be talking about something that we personally haven't experienced. I think it is critical. And with things like social op uh, media, we have so much opportunity to dip into things that we wouldn't have information about otherwise. And it, given our profession, it is our responsibility to do so across library types, in my opinion. So, um, and that helps us, those obviously, that kind of access to those signals from your own experience, observations and your colleagues helps you work together to build those futures, uh, alternate futures. But I would say also, as you people are sharing those signals, to have to you know kind of have an open s safe space to be like well what exactly does that mean um like wh i don't know who was talking about the masked singer show so at first i thought you said a mass seder and i was like I, who did a mass seder i can't believe it was it on youtube and i was too nervous at first to go oh my god i would watch a mass seder okay <laughs> so um <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. It's fine. <laughs> so, you know, but I do know the Masked Singer show. But I was like, wow, that's interesting. But, you know, just to, uh, even in a safe way, maybe it's something that you're like, well, um, someone is saying something either that you don't want to offend them or something. Even to just, I always try to use this phrase, just say, could you say more about that? Just, you know, like, I don't get that. I'm scared of them. What are they doing? They're taking over the bus or whatever. Just. Could you say more about that? Just to, to, to safely get to something that may not be your jam or you don't want to seem like that person, right? So that's, that's what, a, and I will look for the mass Seder later. Maybe I should do one, I don't know. So um, I hope you didn't come thinking we we're gonna talk about self-driving cars and <laughs> flying cars and the singularity, the merging of machine and human Ooh, intelligence. self-driving cars. I do. Um, but again, to Adrian Marie Brown's, it's not about the what, it's about the how. Mm -hmm. And so more than anything, I hope that we had this opportunity to talk about different things that we don't normally talk about in libraries. And I hope you will be inspired to go back to your organizations and find new ways to talk with other people about things that aren't inherent to what we're doing in libraries, but that have that long-term potential. So I think we have about maybe eight minutes to chat, Was I'm on it. 
Um, so eight minutes to chat as you'd like, and then Veronda and I are both also hanging out. Mm -hmm. So we can also just do. Oh, I think Brian, do you want to say something? Well, I, I just have a I have a question for I'm you. I'm sorry, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Who said you could ask right. questions? You know, right around here we have like the Museum of Ice Cream, and you know all these museums of um, oh. three three dimensional like experiences yeah. where people are really going to places now. They are not museums. Right, but they're. They're, they're, insta they're Instagram experiences. So can you talk about anything like that in terms of the, how that's, you know, the filter based of our world of like, you know, taking your photo, filtering it, mm. all of how that affects how we use our spaces? This is interesting because I think we're prejudiced because, I, I, come on. But see, this you we're doing the thing we just said not to do. So I'm just gonna give you my I don't want to talk about this because the Wonder Museum is in Chicago. And I was going to go and invited him. It is $35 to get into the Wonder Museum. It is a privately owned piece of art that a collector is financing his purchase of that collection by charging people to have 30 seconds in the room with it. And, it and rushing them out. And it irritates me to no end that they yeah. have dubbed that a museum. And, and I invite, isn't that funny? And I said, hey, do you want to go to this with me? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And I said, no, because we have values and we know what a museum <laughs> is. You see why we're friends? If it's they had, like if they had called exchange. it anything other than a museum, that's, that's my only, that's my beef with it. So beyond that, I mean, I think that the, I think what a lot of these public spaces tell us is that people do want to have a sense of pride in the public spaces that they have. As you brought up Eric Kleinenberg's, you know, palaces for the people, I think that there is that sense of strong connection. If you look at what's happening in academic libraries right now, they are designing academic libraries to be part of the parent tour before freshman year. I know that's what they're doing. They're trying to create an asset in that community where parents will feel safe sending their students, sending their uh, children to that space. And so we may also want to think of how do we develop an aesthetic that conveys safety, that con conveys joy, whatever it may be, in visual as much as the programmatic elements so or the collection elements. Brian, were you saying uh, more how do we engage people who want that experience too, or no? Somewhat. I mean, you know, there's that's just a that's a, it's a signal. It's a, that's a signal out there that you're seeing people line up and that, mm -hmm. like you're saying over there, it's you know, it's a one hour experience. It's thirty dollars or forty dollars, so it's very exclusive about having access, right? Which is mm -hmm. the antithesis of the library, right? Of of that exclusivity. So, but it, you know, that's just what we're seeing around us, like here in the Bay Area, that those are pop. Those are popping up in like these historic buildings that just really operate those as private spaces, which are exclusive to others. I mean, I, I this I am thinking out loud right now, which is not probably a good idea, but I feel like you are gonna just like go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wonder what it would be like to try to partner with one of those things and value add to it as a library and to be there and to like deepen that experience. Of course, they'd probably charge us to deliver this public good. But uh, I mean, it would be, I, 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 my uh, executive director has like, that's our competition, let's say, library's competition for attention, space, and time. To get close to that competitor and what, could we do together? What what's our shared goal? What do we have in common? Um, it, or what are what could we uh, value add to what they have? Is one thing we like to think of. Yep, My so, next president okay. would like to speak. Well, I just wanted to point out that a lot of these pop up museums are a threat to curated museums mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Like they're very much like the librarianship where mm -hmm. and Apple stores where they are not curated by a professional or someone who has a degree which has its plus and minuses, just like having an Apple store in a library building. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, I think a lot of libraries are taking advantage, are recognizing these signals and building in little experiences. So God bless those children's librarians who do the animal overnights in the library. That is totally taking, they're taking that Instagram ability, that experience thing, and they're figuring it out. I love going into a library where whether by design or they retrofitted, 
a window into the sorting machine. Oh, yeah. Because With the little step stool so kids can see it. Because people like a behind-the-scenes element, and they're starting to figure out, like, that's something interesting. Jane McGonigal was involved with the New York Public Library. They had an overnight experience for teenagers where they actually got to spend overnight in the library and they gamified the public library to provide, again, that trade on an experience that has exclusivity but is accessible to lots of people. So they make something exclusive, broadly accessible. And it can be something that is simple. Um, but we do have to think creatively about what's the behind the scenes curiosity that we can exploit that is still safe for us to exploit for lots of different people. Librarian for a day, I mean, the librarian of Con when Dr. Hayden brought that little girl who had read all yes, the books, yes. I mean, that was something viral that I think Dr. Hayden and her team at the Library of Congress recognized the value of experience that they could provide for that young person. And us to get to see, to, ex to be along for the ride. These aren't high tech changes, I don't think, it's just recognizing the pattern and signals. I'm not sure saying the one minute thing, but also I did have a thing to say, um, and it kind of goes to the the like the the shock or the the Marvel value of uh, Instagrammable moments. And I'm reminded of um, uh, the photographer and essayist and novelist uh, Teju Cole, who um, he's like, look at we all think we're having this very unique moment taking a picture of this thing, and then his photo project was we all took the same photo yes. <laughs> in yeah. the same areas, and I feel like that's kind of a capturing moment, both for our our feeling of loneliness and our mm -hmm. feeling of like, oh, we actually are kind of synchronizing our brains even when we don't realize yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's, I had that, um, we'll end on this very shallow note. Um, when I first moved to Chicago, and you know, I was so interesting and young, and I was at this, on the subway, and I see this Jennifer Convertible ad, and it's a black girl with locks like mine, a thumb ring, hugging her white college roommate. I thought I was so interesting. That was me and my college, you know, and there was something to be said for like thinking you're so unique and then you s see your, s and I don't have that, a lot of you like, oh, that Billy looks like me on TV. So for me to be like, <laughs> I am a cliche. And she, she's like, your college roommate's coming to town. And I'm like, my college roommate is coming to town. <laughs> and we look just like that. So it was like, I, I am, you know, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. <laughs> all right. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank just Brian you. Help wrap up. <laughs> We're going to hang out. Veranda's friendlier than I am, but I can take <laughs> it. So he's, he's lying. He's nice. It's just different. <laughs>